reading about these options was good for me, but, but I needed a more hands-on experience to get, a, to get a better feel for what was really going on on the land. So I visited with farmers. I pitched my tent on their grounds. I birded their fields in hopes to learn how they were living in harmony with the land. Knowing the farm and the farmer can powerfully shape our decisions about diet, food purchases, and actions that influence the future of farming. So let me tell you a bit about a few of the agrarians that I met during my travels. Hello, welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the director of Cambridge Forum, and I must say we have a fabulous program in store for you today. Each of my esteemed guests is pretty worthy of a program themselves, but thanks to technology, we are able to unite them all digitally from various corners of the planet. So today I invite you to join us as we escape outside our physical limitations to enjoy the beauty of nature and relish all the wonders that the natural environment can offer us in terms of bird song, plants and wildlife. So first, let me begin by introducing John Marsluff, who joins us from Seattle, where he is Professor of Wildlife Science at the University of Washington. As an ornithologist, John has written several books, but his latest has a wonderfully romantic title, In Search of Meadowlarks, Birds, Palms and Food in Harmony with the Land. For me, it instantly conjures up images of the English countryside and the music of Vaughan Williams with the lark ascending. So, what is this with meadowlarks, John? Well, Mary, uh, thanks for that. And uh, my, my fascination with meadowlarks is really a broader picture that they paint. They're emblematic of pressing conservation concerns, which is primarily the simplification and intensification of once diverse farmlands and the effects this is having on grassland species worldwide. Let me play you one of their songs quick and I think it'll get the point across. This is a Western meadowlark. And this bird uh, and other meadowlarks have enlivened the prairies in America for millions of years, way before humans first arrived. But I guess those early hunters and gatherers certainly celebrated the bird's bright whistles and its gurgling flute-like rambles. The allure of these birds, whether it's their lively song, as you just heard, or their sharp dress. I love the rich black V that's on their neck that's uh, set off against a really bright yellow breast. And that uh, allure has continued to this day. Councilors, schools, roads, businesses take their name from the metal arc, and six U.S. states celebrate this avian as their official state bird. And I came to know meadowlarks as a young boy growing up in Kansas. The chunky robin-sized flyers were common there. They were in farmland, weedy verges, grassy suburb, and even grassy suburban lots. And while uh, they are found throughout much of North America and Central America to this day, their numbers have declined drastically. Eastern meadowlarks, for example, have declined by 71% since scientists started counting them in the 1960s. And the reasons for these losses are easily understood. So I wrote In Search of Metal Arcs to bring these issues to a wide audience and offer some practical advice on what we can all do to conserve life on the farm. Let me go into that a bit. The reasons that grassland animals are at increasing risk of extinction is quite simply the loss of grass and the conversion of their prairie homes to high intensity farmland. Most of these farms are expansive monocultures of corn, wheat, soybeans, rice, barley, or oats. Grasslands once covered a quarter of Earth's land surface, but by the end of the 20th century, we had removed over a fifth of that, mostly converting it to cropland. In North America, it's been even worse. Over half of our grasslands are gone, and conversion is continuing at a fierce pace. For example, from 2009 to 15, 55 million more acres were converted, which was 13% of all the grass that remained. And since the 70s, these acres have been subjected to increasing amounts of herbicides and pesticides, which remove much of the grassland birds needed cover and foods, especially the insects they feed to their young. Once surrounded by a wide diversity of birds, today's farmers in North America are now rarely in the company of prairie chickens, bobolinks, or meadowlarks. And their counterparts in Europe, similarly, would be lucky to hear the call of a stone curlew or see the flash of a red-backed shrike on the hunt for grasshoppers and mice in their fields. You might ask, 
Why should we be concerned with this loss? After all, we need to eat, which is true enough, but birds and other farmland wildlife are important to our health, productivity, and well being. Culturally, they stimulate our art, language, and sport. Encountering them soothes our stress. For example, when the novel coronavirus hit, many rediscovered the importance of nearby nature to provide a sign of life and hope, and no aspect of nature is more evident than our birds. Bird watching and feeding also pump billions of dollars into our economies each year. The occurrence of particular birds is a barometer of land health, and some even warn us about the emergence of new threats, as dying crows did when West Nile virus spread across North America. And birds provide us ecosystem services in the form of pollination, fertilization, seed dispersal, carrying consumption, and pest removal, each of which is especially important on our farmlands. But beyond the multifaceted importance of birds and other animals to our social and economic welfare, learning about the struggle to conserve birds on farms forces us to confront one of our greatest challenges, how to feed an increasing and increasingly affluent human population without destroying natural systems. Some researchers estimate that if we continue with our current farming methods and increasingly meat-rich diets, that we'll have to farm every bit of land that remains uncultivated to sustain our species. In response to such dire predictions, others show how changes in diet, farming technology, and food handling can allow us to nourish ourselves and provide for nature. <clears throat> Reading about these options was good for me, but, but I needed a more hands-on experience to get, a, to get a better feel for what was really going on on the land. So I visited with farmers. I pitched my tent on their grounds. I birded their fields in hopes to learn how they were living in harmony with the land. Knowing the farm and the farmer can powerfully shape our decisions about diet, food purchases, and actions that influence the future of farming. So let me tell you a bit about a few of the agrarians that I met during my travels. I started my adventure in a soybean field in southeastern Nebraska. Here rows of corn and soy stretch from horizon to horizon. My in-laws were Depression-era farmers of these deep soils, but today their hometown is inhabited mostly by ghosts and the old tapestry of small multi-crop farms that diversified the land is gone. <clears throat> I found nature here, but mostly it was characteristic of forest, not prairie. Woodpeckers, great horned owls, cardinals, and chickadees lived in the few woodlots that surrounded small ponds or farmsteads, but gone were the meadowlarks, pheasants, quail, harriers, and dick sizzles that once thrived here. This is typical of middle America, but seeing it through my mother-in-law's eyes and talking to the farmers that still remained emphasized to me the power of governmental incentives to shape the land. The farmers I met could not afford to set aside land for nature as provided for in our National Conservation Reserve Program. They could only afford to grow corn and soy because in so doing, they earned subsidies in the form of federal crop insurance and inflated prices driven by the demands for cattle feed and ethanol. The corn they grow doesn't feed us directly. It, it feeds our dependents on grain-fed beef and inefficient biofuels. 40% of the corn grown in the US is fermented into ethanol and nearly as much as used to feed cattle people eat less than 3% of the corn raised in the US. I left Nebraska with a conviction to remove grain-fed beef from my diet. Bison has become a staple, but as I drove into the Centennial Valley of Montana, I learned about another option. Here, Hillary and Andrew Anderson were raising cattle entirely on grass. They graze within a national wildlife refuge and by rotating their herds among many pastures helped to sustain a diverse and native grassland bird community. Sage grouse lecked here, sage thrashers sang, Wilson snipe danced through the dark skies above my tent. Even traditional challenges to the rancher, large carnivores like grizzly bears and wolves were tolerated by the Andersons. And through local gatherings, they are building a community among other ranchers to sustain the land and the wild creatures that share it with them. Knowing how these ranchers and others that raise bison in the region invigorate and conserve grassland ecosystems taught me that red meat can be part of my diet, but that I needed to know how its production affected the land. So many of uh, my colleagues that are joining us here today are experts in organic farming. And the, the farms employing such methods that I visited also supported rich wildlife communities. 
This occurs for myriad reasons, including the obvious avoidance of chemical pesticides and herbicides, but also especially because these operations often rest some of their land, which is then used by wildlife. The organic farms I visited in Washington and Costa Rica were highly diversified, raising many different crops in small fields. And importantly, they didn't farm their entire acreages simultaneously, but rather reserved parts for nature or fallowed some fields in some years. One farm even grew native plants to restore the vegetation along a river that provided irrigation for their enterprise. These efforts to provide native habitat and fallow fields was critical for birds. Common yellowthroats, for example, fed on insects and stashed their recently flighted young in the fallowed land at Oxbow Farm and Conservation Center. There, farmers waited to mow the grass until these neat black masked warblers had migrated. Fallow land was also important to birds on some traditional farms and ranches I visited. Wheat farms in Montana, I found, were rarely irrigated. Instead, they practice what's called dry land farming, where the land is left fallow for one year to store rainwater and then grows crops on the other two years. During this fallow period, horn larks abound. They would sound much more like the, the lark that, that Mary brought up at the beginning here. And on a cow-calf operation that supplemented an early grass diet with grains, rotational grazing still allowed time for bobolinks to breed when cattle were off the land. Bobolinks are, and other grassland birds often fail to breed successfully on traditional farms because frequent and especially early, early mowing of grass destroys nests. And in California, Frank Mueller raises tomatoes, peppers, and almonds, but rather than plow and plant every inch of his ranch, he leaves the hard to reach places alone. Triangles of land that are too narrow for the plow <clears throat> or naturally boggy areas that were a constant battle in the past are now spared and they're shared with quail, woodpeckers, and coyotes. <clears throat> Another less obvious aspect of organic farming that promoted wildlife was a general tolerance by the farmers. In Costa Rica, for example, cacao farmers and those raising diverse fruit and veggie crops for their families tolerated raiding monkeys, coatis, and even a lot of snakes. I even found some farms that went out of their way to attract wildlife, in part to help raise their crops. Frank, the California farmer I mentioned earlier, plants hedgerows around his fields for songbirds that eat insect pests. And rather than herbicide the roadsides, he encourages native flowers used by insects that are also important pollinators. But the wineries of Napa and Sacramento uh, take this approach to the extreme. There are thousands of nest boxes for owls and falcons, as well as perches for hawks festoon the, the vineyards. These predators are invited into the fields because they eat voles and gophers that can destroy grapevines. Researchers at Humboldt State University and the University of California Davis study these places and find that a barn owl, for example, raising its hungry brood in a Napa vineyard eats around a thousand rodents each year. Julie Johnson, who owns Trace Sabore's vineyards, counts on her owls to reduce her rodent pests, and she has boxes for bluebirds and tree swallows as well to help control problematic insects. Employing such animal labor helps her produce a fine and affordable organic wine. Now some shy, wide-ranging, and specialized animals need more than a farm can offer. <clears throat> they absolutely require large native reserves, such as only found in national parks, wilderness areas, and some private holdings. Some researchers note that this and suggest that society adopt what they call a land sparing approach to agriculture. In this, we spare land for reserves and intensively farm other land for food. My time in Nebraska didn't convince me that this is a sustainable approach. As economics reward cropping, even spared and marginal lands are quickly brought under cultivation and corn is spread west in Nebraska in response to this. Only in a few situations where sparing is required as land use is intensified, does that approach seem to work very well. And I agree we need reserves, but I also believe we need farms that share their lands with wildlife, such as those I referred to earlier. Not only does wildlife benefit from this sharing culture, so too do farmers. All farmers I met loved their land and reveled in the wild birds and beasts that shared it with them. Most did what was economically feasible for wildlife simply because it was the right thing to do. And keeping farmers connected rather than distance from wildlife is to me a critical reason 
why they should be incentivized to share their lands. Let me wrap up by returning to the challenge of how we can share land with nature and feed a human population expected to reach 11 billion by the year 2100. Recent modeling exercises emphasize three primary ways in which we can ensure adequate food for people and adequate space and resources for wildlife. First, close the gap in production on current farmland between what is there now and what could be produced through more precise allocation of water and fertilizer, planning of new and diverse crop varieties, increased sharing of knowledge and enhanced infrastructure. Second, reduce food waste. Approximately a third of all the food produced never reaches the market or our mouths. And third, reformulate our diet to include less grain-fed ruminant meat, which is from cows, goats, and sheep. We don't all need to become vegans or even vegetarians, but given that today a third of all arable land grows food for livestock, not us, culling the herd would seem to reduce the amount of farmland needed, lessen emission of greenhouse gases, and simultaneously provide us with a healthier diet. In short, we need to change how we grow, waste, and consume food. Our environmental impacts are expected to lessen even as our population increases if we cut food waste by 50 to 75 percent, reap 75 to 90 percent of the productivity that our current land can provide, and adopt a diet that limits red meat to a single serving each week, limits white meat and dairy to half and a full portion per day respectively. Quite a diverse diet. Meeting this grand challenge might seem beyond your control, but we can all play a part here. Together, many small actions add up to large changes. I'm optimistic. I mean, just think of what we've done in the last few months in response to a challenge. Adjusting your diet and shopping habits, getting to know and support your local farmers, and lobbying your policymakers for incentives that would, that would allow farmers to do the right things on their lands will, to use Aldo Leopold's words, increase the stability, integrity, and beauty of our planet. Failing that challenge dooms future generations to a lonely life made even more difficult without the services provided by intact ecosystems and less pleasurable from the loss of daily encounters with wild nature. Thanks for listening. Well, wow, that's a fascinating book. There's a lot, there's a lot of stuff you've raised there. So I like the, the meadow lark singing. That was very nice to hear that. So I think a lot of people during this lockdown period They've had a renewed appreciation for bird song because they can hear it. Or maybe they're missing things, noticing birds they don't hear anymore. So with that, I'm going to jump over to Ronnie Cummings. Ronnie's the founder and director of the Organic Consumers Association. He's been a lifelong activist for many causes, but definitely the organic cause. And he's part of Regeneration International. Ronnie, I know you're joining us from Via Organica, which is a farm, a training farm in Mexico, where you've been holed up for a few weeks now because of the limitations on leaving. Um, you've recently wrote a book called Grassroots Rising, and you said you wrote it because nobody else was doing it. So can you tell us a bit about why you wrote it and why you felt it was the time to call to action? Yes. Well, um, there's lots of books out there about the climate crisis, but almost all of them talk almost exclusively in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by converting to alternative energy and energy conservation. And of course, those are very important. On the other hand, there's lots of books out there about regenerative agriculture. Uh, and unfortunately, typically those focus on individual farms and ranches and don't talk much about the big picture. So I wanted to write a book that was a roadmap for the United States about how we go from where we are now, which has uh, created a climate emergency and a public health emergency, environmental emergency, uh, an impoverishment of rural America, uh, a you know sharp decrease in biodiversity. Uh, how do we get from where we are now, which I call a degenerative society, to a regenerative state. Uh, and if we really uh, want to have high goals, which we need to have for the rest of the world to be inspired 
I think we should adopt the Green New Deal as supported by 100 or so members of Congress, articulated by the Sunrise Movement and Alexander Ocasio-Cortez and some of the candidates who've been uh, running for the Democratic nomination, like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. Um, and basically, we're saying that we can reach zero net emissions in 10 years if we will combine the good trends we already have moving to alternative energy and energy conservation with a massive drawdown of carbon from the atmosphere and putting it back where it used to be in our trees, in our plants, in our soil, in our grasslands. Uh, and what I lay out in the final chapter of the book is how we take this 1.9 million acres of, um, excuse me, 1.9 billion acres of farmland in the United States, pasture land, crop land, uh, and uh, forests as well, how we can go from sequestering 10% or 11% of the emissions we're putting up now uh, into sequestering uh, half of it. Uh, and if we do this, if we increase uh, the levels of photosynthesis and regenerative land management of fourfold or so over the next 10 years, while we reduce uh, emissions by 50%, we can reach uh, a zero net emissions by 2030. That means that what we'll still be putting up in terms of emissions will be drawing down. Uh, and of course, scientists tell us that it's not enough to just reach zero net emissions in 2030, or many people have a far too lax uh, timeline for 2050. Beyond the year 2030, we need to start drawing down more carbon uh, and greenhouse gases than we're actually putting up there if we want to gradually restabilize the climate over time. So th there's th the good news is that the practices that we need in order to move to alternative energy and to move to regenerative uh, food farming and land use practices, they already exist. We don't need to uh, uh, reinvent the wheel. John uh, talked about some of the regenerative ranching that's going on. Uh, you know, Michael will talk about uh, the uh, micro bio-intensive organic growing that's already going on. Um, we already have in every state, in every county in the United States, examples of best practices in terms of regenerative agriculture. Uh, regenerative agriculture is simply the next stage of organic where we focus on soil health and focus on carbon sequestration uh, as well as not using the chemicals and fertilizers. So these practices exist in embryonic form already. The, how are we going to make these regenerative organic practices the norm? How are we going to make regenerative forestry and ecosystem restoration practices the norm. We already know how to reforest, you know, in a way that's species appropriate, in a way that works. We already know how to restore wetlands and grasslands. We know how to restore marine ecosystems. The problem is that these are the alternative. These are the niche practices now, not the norm. So four things are gonna be required, and I think we already see these developing. One of them is consumer and voter awareness. If people don't understand that there's hope that we can turn things around and make, not only fix the climate, but fix our public health catastrophe, fix the, the uh, economic situation in rural areas, bring urban and rural people together, restore biodiversity and habitat. Uh, once you get people to see that we can do it, uh, the next stage is to call attention to the best practices because we know what they are, but the general public uh, tends to be depressed, you know, and not hopeful that we can do this. So we need to take these best practices, shine the spotlight on them, magnify them, get everyone aware of this. But the third point, which is key, we got to have, we got to change public policy. We got to change political power. Right now, we, we do have subsidies for food farming and land use. The problem is they're subsidizing degenerative practices. We're paying farmers and ranchers to farm and ranch the wrong way. You know, we're subsidizing the production of food 
that is so low in nutrients that 40% of Americans have chronic diseases, and many of them, when they come into contact with this coronavirus, die. Uh, these pre-existing conditions we hear so much about uh, that cause people to have to go to the hospital and that cause them to have to go into ventilators where most of them die. These pre-existing conditions, these aren't acts of God. You know, these are functions of your diet, your environment, the stress in your life. Uh, and we can have a healthier population. We didn't used to have 40% of our population with chronic diseases like we did now. When my grandparents uh, operated a family organic farm in East Texas in the 50s and 60s, a lot of these chronic diseases, no one had even heard of these before. So we must change policy. It's gonna cost hundreds of billions of dollars over the next 10 years to change our degenerative food farming and land use system into one that is regenerative. But look at what, you know, we're spending trillions now, you know, trying to make up for the degenerative practices that have led us to this point. Uh, we can afford to do it and we will do it. The fourth factor, which is extremely important, uh, we can't count on the government for $840 billion a year is called for in the Green New Deal plan, say of Bernie Sanders to regenerate agriculture. We need our private money and our public money working together. And there's plenty of money. I mean, Americans in our savings plans, in our retirement plans, we have $25 trillion, you know, right now. You know, we have trillions of dollars in the stock market invested in things like fossil fuels and uh, industrial agriculture, industrial timber uh, extraction, and so on. There's plenty of money to do it if we have the political will. So I'll just conclude by saying that the solution to our catastrophe, our catastrophic times that we're facing, and believe me, this, this uh, uh, pandemic is just a, a small dress rehearsal for climate catastrophe, but the solutions are at hand. They're as close as the knives and forks in our hand, as John pointed out. We've got to vote for regenerative food and farming and land use every time we pull out our wallet, every time we go to the store, every time we walk into the kitchen, every time we think about what we're going to eat. Uh, and the solution is right under our feet. It's in the incredible universe of uh, microorganisms and biology that are down there. I mean, once upon a time, the earth had three to 8% carbon organic matter on the average, on the average in our soils. Right now we have 1%. Well, where did that other two to 7% of carbon organic matter that used to be in our soils and our biota go? It went up in the atmosphere, it went into the oceans. We can get it back down, uh, but we can only get it back down as part of a society-wide change that is gonna take us big changes, not little changes, uh, but we can do all this. And this is not a partisan issue. You know, everyone in America is concerned about health. Everyone in America is starting to realize that we have a climate catastrophe that we must solve. Everyone in America nearly is disenchanted with our 519,000 elected and appointed public officials at the local, county, state, and federal level. All right, you look at all the polls, all of us want the same thing. All of us want our children and our grandchildren to grow up in a world that is livable, that is not catastrophic. And I'll close by saying that, however, however, if we reach this regenerative uh, goal in the United States, this is still got, not gonna be enough to solve the, the global crises we're facing. This is a global problem with global solutions. And when you look at regenerative farming and ranching and land use, it's simply, much easier and much faster to sequester a lot of carbon in the areas around the equator 
and in the global south, and also the semi-arid and arid areas of the world, which are 40% of our landscape, are so degraded that when you apply regenerative practices, you really have a, uh, a rapid increase in carbon. Uh, and so we're all in this together. We can all get out of this together. Uh, and uh, I hope people will take a look at my book, Grassroots Rising, Call to Action on Climate, Farming, Food, and a Green New Deal. If you're interested in a specific roadmap on what we can here do in the United States with our 1.9 billion acres of pasture land and range land and, and uh, forest land, urban land, uh, park lands. Thank you. Wow, Ronnie. <laughs> a real call to action on many fronts. One of the people that has actually taken your words to heart is going to join us next. And Michael Chisiano um, from Long Island has got a farm called Naked Farm. And he transitioned from being a Brooklyn businessman, uh, and now he's a biointensive farmer. So, Michael, if you could tell us a bit about why you did such a dramatic change of career, and how you fell in love with working the land, and what that learning curve was like. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I am a leisurely cigar smoker. So, uh, we built a home in Orient on the sound and the Connecticut River is only eight miles away. So I was reading an article in Cigar Aficionado magazine and it stated how a fine cigar was made and they said that the best wrapper leaves of a cigar were grown in the Connecticut River Valley and there I am staring at the Connecticut River right across the sound. So right away I started thinking why isn't that done on Long Island. We are so close. It just started getting the wheel spinning. I started researching it and um, <clears throat> started getting very interested in it. Um, hooked up with one of the researchers, uh, the research scientists up in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, took a trip up there, saw the farms, I'm very impressed. Um, got to meet one of the farmers, uh, spoke to them, and I said, I asked, could you please uh, let me know when you're starting to farm? I'd like to come up and check it out. So they did. And I actually worked with the farmers in the Connecticut River Valley for four years, um, labor in exchange for knowledge. Um, I was so taken back by the farming industry. Once I got dirt in my boots, I couldn't get away from it. It was the thing. I mean... I started late in life, uh, probably, you know, 55 years old, a little late, but um, I was very excited about it. I brought it down to Orient and I started speaking to the farmers um, out on the east end of Long Island and <clears throat> nobody really knew much about it. So one of the farmers was good enough to actually let me do a trial on his land. So I grew, um, three acres of tobacco, came out beautifully, um, sold it to AJ Fernandez in Nicaragua. Um, I really wanted to continue doing that because it's just a very unique thing. But unfortunately, dealing with the people in Nicaragua from a business standpoint of view uh, wasn't pleasurable. And at my age, I didn't need that anymore because I dealt with that in the city. So I still needed to farm. I couldn't get it out of my system. I had to farm. So I just checked out alternative farming styles online and this one fellow popped up. His name was J.M. Fortier, John Martin Fortier. He's uh, from Canada and he started speaking about this biointensive way of farming. So I studied up on that and it just makes all the sense in the world. It really does. First of all, biointensive, just a little explanation of it. Um, bio meaning we use the biology of the soil in order to grow the best quality crop. Intensive means the spacing of the crop. It's based on a 30 inch wide permanent bed system. And what you do is you constantly add compost. So you're always adding to the land. You're never taking away from the land. I worked with 
a conventional farmer out here, actually the fellow who let me use his land to grow the tobacco, I worked with him for five years. And he, 120 acre farm, um, huge machinery, uh, huge discs. So every time we prepped the field, we'd go into that field with a 20 foot disc and just rip the soil apart. And you go up and down and do five acres of that and you turn around and there was not one bit of anything alive in that soil. The only way that you were going to grow crop in that soil was to add man-made fertilizer and lots of it. I mean, it's just not the way to do it. It really isn't. And as you're disking and as you're disking, you're, you're, these fields were big divots because you're just taking all the soil away and just constantly pulling it away. Anyway, the biointensive method is totally opposite. First of all, you need organic matter to grow any type of vegetable. You need, well, to grow quality vegetable. You need um, all that biology in the soil to help with that. And you have to add to the soil uh, to condition the soil. Um, <clears throat> um, biointensive is not a new thing. It's been going on in Europe for years and years and years. Um, what happens is, uh, on these 30 inch beds, we never step on the bed. So the soil never gets compacted. So you just keep putting compost on these beds and you plant because you don't compact the roots grow down. They don't compete on a horizontal with the plants next to them. So I could, on a 30 inch wide bed, I could grow five rows of radishes one inch apart 45 feet long i could generate 200 bunches of radishes out of a 30 inch by 45 foot long bed i have 16 of those beds that's what i started out with last season i increased this season to 25. my little farm could produce what a conventional farm could produce in five acres on a tenth of an acre and this is the way it should be done. There, are, there is a, a farm called Steadfast Farm in Mesa, Arizona. It's the first of its kind. They're calling it an agri-hood. It's a housing development. And smack dab in the middle of this housing development, they put a biointensive farm. This farm is feeding that whole community along with the restaurants in the community and the stores in the community. So this regenerative way of farming should catch on and it should be the way that it's done. There's also another one that just started in Raleigh, North Carolina. It's called Raleigh City Farm. Same basic principle. Um, a big plot of land in the middle of Raleigh was given to a farmer and he's actually biointensive farming on it and he's intending to feed most of the local community. And that's basically the way it should be done. Um, last year, I tried it because uh, we live in a city very close to Greenport, uh, New York, which is, um, uh, it's regenerifying uh, a lot of restaurants. So I figured, let me strike while the iron's hot, uh, set up a little farm stand. I did really well. Uh, that's how I met Mary. That's right. <laughs> and, um, I couldn't keep up with the demand. So actually, my, my passion is really, we live in an agricultural area with all these farms that are struggling, 120 acre farms, 150 acre farms. And these uh, sons and daughters of these farmers who saw their mothers and fathers struggle all their lives trying to keep up with this, really don't want any part of it anymore. My thing is, to try to teach these high school kids that it can be done. Um, John Martin Fortier farms an acre and a half, and he does well over $100,000 a year in sales. There's a fellow called Connor Crickmore, who's based out of uh, Claryville, New York, another fellow from Brooklyn. He's on an acre and a third, and he does $300,000 a year in sales. Um, there's no machinery. Everything's basically done by hand. I have one two-wheel walk-behind BCS tractor that I use just to tilt. That's all I use it for. 
um, that's an Italian made tractor just for this 30 inch wide permabed system. Um, and basically this, this is the real way we should be eating. My vegetables, uh, because of the biointensive method, the color is incredible. Uh, it's, it's just, it's so different than what you're used to buying from a regular supermarket. And, you know, being from the city, um, I'm familiar with the Bronx terminal market and places like that where the produce gets shipped in and sits in a refrigerated trailer two weeks before it gets to, to the produce stores. I mean, it's, it's really doesn't make sense. And because land is so expensive on Long Island, uh, you could farm in a very small space and you know, it's, it's really the way it should be done. Well, while I've got you on this topic, we've got someone that's typed a question in here. Um, mm -hmm. They are an organic farm teacher, okay. uh, Holly Hill Farming Cohasset, John Belber. He says, where is the focus on making compost nationwide? Well, to make compost, uh, I, I, to be honest with you, let's see. Um, I actually buy my compost from Vermont Compost Company. Um, you, you can make your own compost. It has to be done right. Um, you need chicken manure, cow manure, green manures, you know, all mixed in. It has to be seasoned. Um, well, that, that is uh, a, 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 an issue, I think, because that, that is the answer. Um, in, in Southeast Asia, at the turn of the century, there was a professor who actually uh, took a trip just to see how these people were actually farming. And they throw nothing away. Everything was composted. Unfortunately, we have plastic now. But even cloth they use as compost, human manure, cow manure, any, any kind of manures, everything was reused. Nothing was wasted. And that's kind of how what we have to get back to at this point. He said that in response to that, food waste is the main ingredient that they use for compost along with leaves. That's what they use at their little farm. That, so. that, that, that is fine, but uh, you, you, you really do need the manure uh, in there, uh, some, so, one way or another. So there's, there's more need for compost production on a, oh, on, absolutely. On a serious level. Would you and agree absolutely. with that, Ronnie? Yes, um, we have a 75 acre farm in uh, uh, north central Mexico, and then we have a 10 acre farm in northern uh, Minnesota where we do our research and where we grow lots of food and raise lots of animals. And uh, like in Mexico, we, uh, what Michael's talking about, it's, it's like we don't have a well in Mexico for our 75 acres, uh, nor do 86% of all the farmers in Mexico. That's part of the reason why we didn't pay the bribes that are necessary to be able to over stress and overdraw the aquifers that will remain. We wanted to do it the traditional way. And so we use rainfall capture. We get about, uh, we get about uh, 20 inches of rain during the rainy season, the four months of the year when it rains. Uh, we try to capture as much as we can of that on rooftops. Uh, then we use the natural terrain. We have these ponds to capture the rain that comes down off the side of the mountains or the hills or just the elevation. So we store something like 12 million liters or, or uh, uh, 3 million gallons of water in our ponds. And then we put those into the cisterns uh, under our buildings. We capture all the water off the roof. Uh, we make sure that we grow uh, species appropriate crops that use the least amount of water possible. Uh, the centerpiece of our farm are desert plants, agave and mesquite trees that are considered uh, uh, junk you know, plants in much of the world. But we uh, chop up our massive agave plant leaves and ferment them along with the cuttings off the mesquite trees. And we get, we get an animal fodder that's one quarter to one half the price of alfalfa and uh, sequesters huge amounts of carbon. So you have to look at all this. But again, you look at our 
all of our bathrooms. We have a conference center and a training center. So we sometimes have 150 people for a conference. That was before the coronavirus. But all of our toilets are composting toilets, you know? And so we capture every ounce of liquid uh, separated off from the solids. Uh, that liquid is urea. This is an extremely important uh, uh, material in, in farming. And we use biochar, large amounts of biochar, which is basically charcoal. Uh, and we mix the urea into the biochar to, to uh, charge it, it's called. And then we're able to use that uh, on the land. It really helps sequester 70% more uh, water, or excuse me, it infiltrates 70% more water. And it also uh, promotes soil fertility. So on and on, you have to look at what is available. I mean, we have horses uh, because we do ecotourism trips for people to the rural villages. We have donkeys, we have ducks, we have chickens, we have pigs, we have goats, we have sheep. We don't have any cows because we're in the high desert. We don't, uh, grass is at a premium. But we use all their different manures. Certain manures are better than others for certain things, but they're all very useful. And then we, we've brought experts on composting down to our ranch to teach seminars. And they've taught us things like, well, in semi-arid, arid areas, you don't have the amount of green matter to put into your compost piles that you would have in, say, uh, North America in the U.S. Uh, or Southern Canada. However, you can make compost uh, and then you put it into a liquid and you either make a compost tea, which you brew over a 24 hour period, or we've learned now compost extracts where you just stir it uh, for an hour or two. And then we take that liquid and we put it in backpack uh, sprayers and we use the liquid. So the 500, uh, you know, 500 gallons of compost tea or compost extract is enough for 25 acres, you know, for one application. So there are ways, uh, if you look into it, uh, people are learning the ancient traditions. This is the way they made compost in India, for example, is not turning the pile. I mean, all of us organic farmers have been turning the piles of compost for the last 50 years because we thought that was the best way to do it. And it is the best way to make uh, solid compost if you, you know, uh, if you want to do it quickly. But David Johnson from New Mexico State University in, in Las Cruces, New Mexico, rediscovered the ancient method of uh, compost making where you, you use a lot of leaf material uh, fungi, high fungal, and you, you put it in these cylinders and you, yeah, you keep it, you keep it wet, 70% uh, uh, moisture, but you don't move it for a whole year. And at the end of the year, you have a magnificent uh, biologically rich high fungal compost that you could take one kilo or two and a half, 2.2 pounds out of the dry material. You put that into uh, 500 liters of water, uh, and you've got a super compost. So, and but but the point that the caller made about using food waste, we must use the food waste, all the food waste from our urban areas. Throwing food and organic material into our landfills creates three to four percent of the world's total greenhouse gases. Plus, it's the driving force behind people using synthetic fertilizer that uses that natural gas that they pack that destroys the soil's ability to sequester carbon that, that you know, reduces the nutrient value. So the cities and the towns, and we do this with San Miguel, we have a relationship with the city to where we're getting the branches and the, and the organic waste gradually more and more every year. But we got to use everything. We got to get rid of plastics uh, and then we can do it. Okay, we have another question from Anne Hawley. She said, how do you go about scaling up the biointensive farming? 
scaling it up? Well, I just added more beds. But I mean, is it something that could be done on a massive scale? I think she means. Or uh, right you now, right, lots of small holdings. Right now, they're experimenting. That same fellow, John Martin Fortier, is experimenting uh, with a 10 acre farm of this same type, which um, they're, they're experimenting with. Uh, tools and machinery and try to mechanize it, mechanize it a little further rather than everything by hand in order to produce more on small space. Um, I don't remember the name of the farm, but if she does look up JM Fortier, um, there will be information on that. Okay, let's switch up to John for a minute. We mustn't forget the birds. So well, I was going to say with respect to compost, I mean, first off, eat everything you can. Think of creative ways to use the food you've got first. So get it into our bodies first. Second, what's left, sure, compost. I'm, I'm not a total advocate of sending it all away from the city somewhere. I think that works in a lot of places. But I think you can use a lot of it at home, not only for your gardening, but in the creation of habitat itself. So instead of I see my neighbors put out buckets of branches to take to our compost facility here in Seattle. It's much better to let that degrade on your land as a brush pile that's now habitat for Pacific wrens or other species that, that need that structure on the ground. So if you're not a farmer, um, sure, try to connect with some to get compost to them. It is an essential ingredient as we've heard, but think about what you can do with it, how you can use it to make habitat. And I would challenge the farmers as well. Um, the more intensive we get on small plots of land, just make sure we leave a little bit of that land for habitat as well, which is easy to do if we're intense in these beds, then you've got space to, uh, to grow habitat for animals as well. So Michael, on your farm, for example, uh, it sounds like it's very densely populated and I can attest to the scale and size of these greens that he produces, they are just dazzling. They look like they're on steroids, these. Uh, I had your radish greens, I think, which I'd yeah. never had before, mm. uh, which are amazing. So are you, are you kind and cooperative with the habitat for the wildlife around you? Or how do you go, go along with that? Do you plant one for you and one for you and one for them? And <laughs> <laughs> no, well, basically, uh, we, have a, we have an issue with deer here. You know, I, I have a, a deer fence up. Um, but basically because my footprint is so small uh all the inhabitants just go about their business and uh you know everything seems to be working out well and do you it's attract right. birds do you find there's a lot of birds and wildlife around i mean there is plenty of wildlife yes absolutely uh bees um you know beneficial insects uh actually we bought a, the lavender farm um and he <laughs> has pollinating bees so I actually planted uh, some wildflowers to attract bees and they come past and pollinate my vegetables. So mm. it, all, it all works well. It all works well. Yeah, yeah and our farm. What a few uh, bird boxes would do along the perimeter of your lands, uh, Michael, are interspersed to get some bluebirds and swallows and wrens in there that would also help control insect pests. It's pretty mm. amazing I, in California They've done some neat experiments where they stake out insects into the fields uh, right. and then look at how quickly they're removed by the birds that are attracted. And it's remarkable. I always thought, ah, it's such a diffuse process. It can't really add up to that much, but, but it really adds up to quite a lot. Well, you mean you kind of come in? Yeah, one of the things is uh, our farm and our, our research farm in Mexico is certified organic, but we have higher aspirations. So we're in the process of being certified biodynamic. And one of the things I love about biodynamic organic, it's the highest form of certification, for example, under the USDA organic, they require you to leave at least 10% of your farm wild, you know? And so we have, it's about 14% of our farm, it's called the Monte or the mountain, you know, in, uh, in Spanish, but that, area we leave uh, we leave alone and occasionally the you know we can have the goats and sheep just make a pass through there but not not very much uh, and that you just really notice 
we've got such beautiful birds, you know, in our area that people come out just for bird watching. Uh, and it also helps, you know, the bees and the other animals uh, uh, or the other insects, beneficial insects, uh, thrive. So I think we need to we need to have that wildness uh, as part of our life wherever we can. And I think in cities, uh, like John said, we need that compost in the cities, uh, in the Victory Gardens in the United States, right before I was born in 1945, we were growing 42% of the nation's vegetables in our cities. And Great Britain at the time was growing 28% of theirs. So there's a billion people in the world out of seven and a half billion who live in urban areas who are growing at least a little bit of their food. Maybe they have a few chickens, they have a garden. And our goal should be to get the urban areas as self-sufficient as we can. It's not just enough to transform 65 million acres of lawn in America uh, to gardens. We need to plant you know, millions and millions of trees in our urban areas as well. And while we're doing it, why don't we plant trees that the birds like, you know, that or that humans, you know, can eat fruit trees or nut trees. I know in the upper Midwest, there's a huge renaissance now of hazelnuts and of elderberries. These are the most incredible perennial crops that you can grow in combination with annual crops, you know, that will uh, transform the environment, sequester the carbon, and produce extremely valuable, you know, instead of finishing pigs, fattening them up on corn, why aren't we fattening them up on hazelnuts? You know, where then the farmer can get like an Italian farmer, you can get three or four times as much for the meat. Why is that? Because it's better. It tastes better. And the pigs are happy. You know, <laughs> animals, all of our animals are free range. It's just like, I think it's extremely important that we get the animals back on the land, that we have a relationship with the animals. These are precious beings. I mean, pick up a little goat, pick up a little sheep. You know, these things are incredible. Pick up a chicken. You know, you look in their eyes, they are smart beings. We are sacrificing them for our survival, you know, but we should be reverent about that. And remember, we need to remember uh, when we're dead, the little animals are going to eat us, you know. <laughs> so let's not hold it against the uh, soil microorganisms that they're going to turn our corpses, if we give them a chance, uh, into something very useful. So, Okay, someone's uh, got a typed in a question. Tom Wilde. How do you reach today's struggling farmers to convince them sustainable biointensive farming is both viable and profitable and that you can get more and better from less? Are agricultural schools selling it? That is a good question. Uh, being that um, I am around conventional farmers and I did explain the biointensive method to them, they say, that's impossible. It can't be. I just showed them my radishes and I go, how could it be impossible? <laughs> um, I don't know if it's being pushed. Uh, it's, uh, it is rolling. I know that it's getting more and more popular. I, is it being taught in the universities? I don't think so. Maybe. But um, hopefully that's where it's all going to go. But um, the old time farmers, they're kind of uh, tunnel visioned people from what I experienced, uh, the uh, farmer that I worked with, his family was farming out here for 400 years. And um, they do a lot of things the same way they did a long time ago. So they're very, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So it's hard to uh, show them something else, basically. But hopefully the newer generation will catch on. Well, how do we do that, though? Because it's well, how, I, I need, I wanted to make one yeah. point. Every yeah. year we, we table, we set up a literature table and we do workshops at the National Gathering of Future Farmers of America. Hmm. And we've done this for the last five years. Where's uh, last, that? 
Where's that? Uh, it moves. But last year it was in Indianapolis. Okay, it's typically in the in the uh, Midwest, and uh, we had sixty thousand students come this year to the conference, uh, junior high and high school, uh, and you know most of the FFA clubs are sponsored by Monsanto or some other chemical agriculture operation, and so the students have already been told the chemical side uh, before, they get, before they get there. But one thing we've really noticed over five years, because uh, we've got giant banners, boycott factory farms, you know, cook organic, not the planet, uh, <laughs> cool the planet, feed the planet. Uh, we are not shy about where, and we bring our young farmers there who are in our network, uh, as well as some older organic farmers. Um, and what we noticed this year, especially, is that uh, most of the boys are kind of shy. They kind of hang back. They're afraid to be embarrassed in front of their peers. But there's a stream of rural girls and young women who just pour up to the table, who take every bit of information there is. They understand things like the climate change is related to chemical, uh, you know, chemical energy intensive agriculture. And they'll tell you things and about pesticides. They'll say, well, you know, my mom and I, we know this is wrong. We know we got to stop this. You know, dad is stubborn. You know, dad does not want to change. Dad points out we got million, we may not have any cash, but we got millions of dollars in assets, right? So the kids are open, you know? And I know we have 35 farm workers on our farm here in Mexico, and they're all under 30, you know? And most of the farmers and herds people in the world today are young, they're under 30. And they're looking for, they're looking for a way to be able to stay on the land and not have to, you know, immigrate to Europe and risk their lives or try to cross the border into the U.S. and risk their lives. And a lot of young people in the United States are looking for, how can I make a living doing farming in a way that I'm proud of? Mm -hmm. And I think the bottom line, how are we going to get farmers to change? The older white guys, the answer is we're not. You know, uh, we're going to get some of them to change. Uh, but how we're going to get them to change is the government is taking our tax money and paying them to be bad farmers, right? That's what's going on. And so we have to pay them. We have to stop paying them to be bad farmers. We have to start paying them even more to be good farmers. Uh, for example, in the United States, we have 175 million acres of public rangelands. 175 million acres. That is a lot of territory. Okay. And these are all these, you know, we tend to think of the ranchers grazing their land on these public lands at a subsidy as, you know, sort of the gun toting libertarians who would like to shoot every Bureau of Land Management official they could see, uh, as well as every wolf they could see and every wild bird. Uh, but just think for a minute, what if we told these ranchers, you know what, we're not gonna charge you to graze your animals anymore on public lands. In fact, we're gonna pay you to experiment with holistic management of grazing, and then we're gonna guarantee you a price for your cattle when they're ready for the auction barn that's considerably higher than what Cargill or Archer Daniels Midland or JPS will pay you right now. I guarantee you, we could start a conversation with America's ranchers right now if we start on that footing. And not all of them, uh, they do appreciate wildlife, a lot of ranchers. You know, they do love their animals. They take care of their animals. They've told me, you think we like the idea if we go to the auction barn with our animals after they've grazed, you know, and then there's three or four people bidding. They're all big companies. They say, take it or leave it. This is the price. And they know full well 
that those animals they've taken care of, they're going off to hell. They're going off to the feedlot. That's the next stop, you know, for these animals. These ranchers, they don't like feedlots. They don't like the fact that consumers look down on ranchers as destroyers of the land, as cruel to animals, you know, as right-wing maniacs who don't care about anyone, you know, out there. I think we can do that, but mainly it's going to be the women and the youth, you know, and the minority people who have never had a chance to farm, who want to farm. And I just say, let's buy off the older guys who are degenerating the land, you know, I don't give a damn how they spend their last 10 years of their life. I just want them to stop destroying the future for my kid and my grandkids, you know, and the only way to do that is you hold up more money than the government's giving them right now. I guarantee you, you hold up more money, most of them will do the right thing. Okay, well, someone's typed in. There's a lot of interesting broad stroke, <laughs> large format information here. What can an individual consumer do right now, aside from dietary change, to further progressive change? Well, you've said quite a lot, Ronnie. What about you, Michael? What do you think? Do you see people changing in the supermarkets where you're supplying your greens? Uh, that's, well, that, that's, that's, that's a rough one. Um, people usually... Uh, you know, when they're shopping, they just go in, get rid of what they want and get out. I mean, you come to my farm stand, you see what I have. You know, that's what you need. More people come into farm stands and local farm stands, uh, organic farm stands, rather than, you know, rushing in a supermarket, rushing out of a supermarket, um, taking a little more time, um, you know, thinking about what you're going to eat. So and, just, sorry, Jim. I was going to say, and getting to know the farmer is essential, I think, to, to know how to make the right decision. If, if you don't know how that farmer is treating the land and the other inhabitants of that land, you, you can't make the right choice. Mm -hmm. It's not always just organic. I mean, I think that's a great thing and we should encourage it wherever we can. But there are a lot of more traditional uh, farmers that are also doing good things on the land, like Ronnie was saying with some of the ranchers that yeah. uh, may have a very traditional operation, but they're, they're supporting lots of other activities, such as a trophy trout stream of one of the, the ranches I visit. You would never guess that you could support a breeding trout population on pristine spring waters in the middle of a cattle farm, but this guy was doing it. And so supporting the actions based upon what we know these farmers are doing, which the best way is to go to their farm stand if they have one or go talk to them and find out where their meat's going and where their crops are going and support that. And lobbying your politicians to do the right thing incentive wise. Incentives drive a tremendous amount about what's planted and why. And uh, without proper incentives instead of the perverse ones we have now, uh, these changes are not gonna happen on a big scale. They can, ha they can happen on a smaller scale. And then one other thing I just wanted to make about the young female farmers, of course, my daughter is one of those. And I think that's absolutely right. That's where the change is occurring. And it's not happening in the traditional agricultural schools to the extent that it could be. It's happening in liberal arts schools and other places where you wouldn't expect mm -hmm. a kid to develop an interest in agriculture, but they can. They can, they can write their own script in some of these places. And, and learn from a, a broader ecological perspective, hey, I want to be engaged on the land and farming is a way to do it. And as Michael has shown, you don't need a ton of land to do it on. You can, you can rent small parcels and get in and start and build from there. And I think that's the key, encouraging that sort of use of the land by young people, helping them get a start, helping them get access to land is a key thing um, that, that we need to work more on. So I want to make sure that everybody knows that um, at the end of this program, if people have questions, particularly young people, that they want to put to you, um, I'll be happy to forward them on to you if, if we can spread the word and answer some of people's questions. Because it's interesting that Michael, basically you just followed your own curiosity here 
and almost a trial and error basis found what matched your values and then you did it. But it wasn't like, oh, I'll sign up at the local college where they have an organic biointensive class. Mm. It was as if you actually had to find your own path. And, and there should be more avenues for people to, to go to what they need. Uh, I, I wish we could run, run, you know, clone you guys and <laughs> have you running around because we need more ambassadors of what's possible. Would you say that that's true? I mean, there's a lot of depressing news out there and all of you guys are very optimistic and, you know, you, you're all talking about the possible. This is all possible, it's all feasible. And I think we have to demystify farming so people realize that, that, that you can make a living and have a family and be a farmer. And it's not some poor relation kind of thing. Well, yeah, you're right, because it, it took me a while to find this little you know, part of farming. Uh, I researched it quite a bit. It wasn't, it was all conventional farming, you know, that's, basically, you know, information on the internet and stuff like that. But it took a little while, you know, but I'm glad I found it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure your customers are too. <laughs> and, and John also, what is it your daughter's farming? She's farming microgreens oh. uh, and expanding to about an acre of land now for um, organic vegetables and trying to target kind of the shoulder season between when there's a bounty of those sorts of things at farmers markets and hit the early and late uh, crops. In Washington, we have a long growing season, so we're lucky in that respect. Um, but yeah, it's the same thing. She followed her uh, passion uh, for more, um, more of an ecological perspective, I think, than anything, and also policy. She's very interested in that. And fortunately, at her liberal arts school, she could uh, develop her own sustainable agriculture major and giving them freedom to do that, which wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy sell to the administrators on her part, uh, but you know, the perseverance to do that either as a student or, or later in life um, is, is what's needed. Okay, we've got a huge question here. I don't know if you guys have got the um, bandwidth to hit the um, question. Somebody anonymous has said, I know this isn't the main topic for today's speakers, but I'd like to know whether each of them has one thought as to how we might advance the conversation globally, starting in the US who thinks we're not the problem regarding human population growth. If we never address that, all other habitats, habitats are eventually going to disappear. Anybody got anything to throw in that direction? Talking about global population growth and whether this is a global problem. Well, I think, I think we're obviously in a global situation. And right before I was born, my parents' generation witnessed a global coalition to stop Nazism, you know? And it was a global coalition. It took enormous effort. It took people from different societies like Russia and the United States working hand in hand together uh, for a common purpose. Uh, we're going to solve this problem only globally. One, one nation can't do it. And so we've got to start thinking about things like, okay, who are, who's the real threat to me and, and my, my kids, right? Is it the Russians? Is it the Chinese? Is it the Iranians? Is it the, you know, Cubans? Is it the Venezuelans? Give me a break, you know? And talking to them, I get a chance to talk to activists from these countries sometime. What I would say to a Russian is, what's the biggest threat you're facing? Is it the CIA and the US and this? You know, I ask a Chinese person that. Is the United States the biggest threat to you or Cuban? The answer to all this, of course, is no. The biggest threat that humans have ever encountered, you know, is the pending climate catastrophe and the interlocked crises that are part of this, one of which are these emerging pandemics. Well, I think everyone in the world at the grassroots level would agree that you know it's not your government, it's not your army, it's not your security service, let's work together. So we need to start preaching that you know, every day 
that the solution is not to fight among each other, to threaten one another, to out trade one another. It's to look at how we can work together. And the population thing, it's, it's pretty clear, I think, for the last 40, 50 years that when, po when, you, when you eliminate or try to eliminate, go to the roots of rural poverty, right? When you go to the roots of rural poverty, which is where the, the sharp increase in population is, where most of the children who die of starvation live and so on. This is a question of rural poverty and empowerment of women, you know? Once women get educated, once women can, like our, our farm worker women are the leaders on our farm in Mexico. Once women realize that they are powerful, that they are strong, that they are capable of being leaders, then they are not going to let guys treat them like objects. You know, I mean, that's what the girls say in, in Mexico, so in rural areas. All the boys want to do is get you in bed, get you pregnant, and then they leave, you know? And it's just like, no. And what is the answer to that? The answer to that is education, self-respect, job opportunity, and of course, family planning, you know, uh, is not some evil thing to kill off little babies. Family planning is, is something so that we don't have, I mean, we got 5 million children dying of hunger every year. And this pandemic is scary, but I guarantee you 5 million people are not going to die this year from this pandemic. But 5 million children, mainly in rural areas, mainly in the global south, are going to die of starvation. And it is our responsibility, all of us in the global community, to pay attention to this and to get to the root of the problem. It's not the girls' fault, you know, in the global south. You know, it is our responsibility to work with them to rise above this situation where your only sense of self-respect is to give in to what these these many times young guys demand of you you know that's what i think there there's no question that population growth is is the root of the problems we're dealing with i think that's absolutely right and empowering women is a way to uh get a handle on that and to even take it to the farm one step further empowering them to own land has been shown to increase the ways in which the land is cared for as well. So uh, involving them as leaders in the community, as land owners is key. And that's a difficult thing in the global South, but that's definitely uh, part of the solution. Well, I just want to thank you all for um, coming in with such energy and passion and information about your farming. Um, for people that are depressed about the situation of the world, you've given us all a lot of positive reinforcement that, that many things are possible. And I think you're all visionaries in your own way, doing that, living your values. So thank you for that. I'm going to make sure that if anyone wants to be hooked up with you, I will be happy to forward your information or send your, their questions on to you. But I want to thank everybody out there for joining us, all the questions that came in. Oh, somebody has actually said that there's a sustainable agricultural link, which uh, I can send this on, permaculture and sustainable agriculture. Thank you, Tim. I will send that on to people. Um, thanks for listening to today's forum. My guests were Professor John Marsloff, author of the book In Search of Meadowlarks, organic evangelical activist Ronnie Cummings and author of Grassroots Rising, biointensive farmer extraordinaire Michael Cisano, and Cambridge Fulham was made possible through the generosity of Herbert and Dorothy Vetter, the Lowell Institute, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, Harvard Bookstore, and First Parish Church in Cambridge. So thanks to everyone for joining us. This program will be posted later on WGBH Forum Network via YouTube and broadcast as an NPR radio show. The next Cambridge Forum, Alchemy of Us, How Humans and Matter Transform One Another, 
will be with Anita Ramirez on Friday, May the 1st at 2.30 and details will be posted on the Cambridge Forum website. So if you'd all like to say goodbye. Goodbye from Mary Stack. Goodbye and thank you for listening and thanks for hosting this, Mary. Well, thanks for <laughs> goodbye, Mary. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> and goodbye to Mexico. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thank you.